Right. Uh, thank you, Alberto, and thank you, Roman, for a nice presentation. As you can see, uh, my name is Henrik, and I'm going to talk about acoustic holographic vision. So in the interest of time, let's just get right to it. Um, human echolocation is a phenomenon in some visually impaired individuals whereby they are able to navigate their environment with surprising skill. Typically, they produce probe sounds like flicking their fingers and then listen for the return echo. Now, this phenomenon has inspired um, several attempts at its technological reproduction. Here's a European example, and this is another approach. And it might be difficult to see what, what the actual applications could be of this if you're not visually impaired, but you have to remember that there are actually visually impairing environments where this sort of technology, if it became a technology, could be very useful. I think it's fair to say that these attempts have not been completely successful yet because there's no actual products in the market. But science and technology is progressing and we think that now is the time to actually re-attempt this challenge. So let's try and look at some visions. You probably uh, remember these scenes from Batman. This isn't actually acoustics, but electromagnetic waves. But the principle is the same, and we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute as well. Another example is the famous rain scene from The Daredevil, where the sound of the raindrops falling allows the daredevil to see uh, a pretty girl's face. Another scene from the same movie is where the sound of the jackhammer allows the daredevil to see his environment in quite some detail. So we can ask what to aim for and I think, well, we need to be in this sort of range. We need to be able to recognize objects in the environment for this to actually to be useful. If we look at animal echolocation, known from dolphins and from bats, uh, who are experts in using this modality, we can learn that ultrasound is simply better because it, it travels better, it's faster, and we can uh, direct it more accurately. In terms of the neuroscience, we also know that echolocation experts use the visual parts of their brain. Uh, one explanation for this might be that it's not just a question of listening for left or right, but it might be a more advanced reconstruction of the acoustic scene. However, there is not really any neural theory which would uh, allow the brain to do this. Fortunately, we do have an acoustic theory. And in uh, acoustic holography, a setup of microphones in an array like this are typically used to analyze vibrations coming off from various machinery. This is a specialized engineering discipline. Um, but there are some issues involved here, and, and I think you can see the first one quite clearly, because if you have something like 10 by 10 microphones, you're going to have a resolution of 100 pixels, so you won't be able to see a lot of detail. Um, so that's the, the, f the first issue. The second issue is related, and that's the processing power required to do the calculations, which of course increase with the resolution. Now, as I said before, science and technology is progressing, and I do think that we actually have the solutions for these problems at hand at the moment. So the, the solution to the first problem would be the application of compressive sensing. We'll get back to that in a minute. To the second issue, we can apply real-time cloud services. And many cloud services uh, let you submit a job, then it's scheduled, and you get a notification when it's done. But there are also services that are actually real-time, streaming problems and answers continually. Um, so we have a number of, of sort of new and upcoming <coughs> mobile devices that are very powerful in terms of their acquisition capabilities, processing, uh, signal processing, and their um, internet connection speeds. So these would allow a high degree of mobility. We can ask, well, how mobile do we really want to be? There's been suggestions of sort of very wearable devices, which I think is probably not uh, mature enough yet, but certainly something handheld would be. 
So just to show you in a little bit more detail what is acoustic holography about, here's a simulated example where we've suppressed one dimension. So it's tr uh, two dimensions instead of three. And what we have up here is the recording plane, which is, are the microphones. And we have here a complicated acoustical source. And as time progresses, the waves from the acoustical source spread out and are recorded at the recording plane. Then we switch to software, to the reconstruction process, where we have a virtual emission plane, which is basically uh, speakers at the same locations as the, as the microphones were originally, but in a virtual environment. And here we play back the recorded sounds in reverse, and the waves will propagate out from the emission plane and come back into focus in a shape corresponding to the original source. So there's a lot of, of details here I'm skipping, like we need to know the acoustical properties of the medium. And another thing is, for this simulation to work, we've used a high number of uh, microphones to record this. And that goes to the question of the resolution, because it's not practical to have that many microphones in real life. And that's where compressive sensing comes in. Um, compressive sensing is based on the, the recent um, discovery that the Nyquist theorem is actually broken. And this is, is quite big news because it has huge practical implications. And one of them is compressive sensing. So what is compressive sensing? Well, we know that the data is required to be sparse. That means it has to be compressible. That's true for most natural signals. So that's all right. And then we also know that it's required that we sample this data more or less randomly. It doesn't have to be perfectly randomly, but the more random, the better. Instead of the sort of regular Nyquist, regular sampling um, that we used to do. So I think we can get a much better idea of this if we look at an example. So here we have a sort of an original image. Now we know this image can be compressed. That's what we do all the time in JPEG and so on. So we can imagine, well, what if we could actually acquire this image in an already compressed form? Then we wouldn't need nearly as many samples. Let's say this is um, maybe compressed 20% of the actual uh, size when it's decompressed. So we would acquire it compressed and then decompress it to get a, a almost as good image. And that's what we've done here. We've randomly sampled that image to about only 20% of their original pixels and from that reconstructed the image. And I think that's quite impressive, uh, especially considering what we, what we used to think. And this has already been applied to acoustic holography. And as you can see here, the resolution of these images is much better than the actual resolution of the original recording array. So the question is, well, can we actually implement this for our own purposes? And I think the best way to evaluate that is to look at what we've done most recently. And, and what we've done is to, to generalize acoustic holography to the electromagnetic case, just like Batman did. And we've recorded uh, electrical potentials in neural tissue instead of acoustic pressure in air. And this looks something like this. So here we're looking at the electromagnetic energy flow vector field and the um, energy source distribution and the energy dissipation as the neural tissue is oscillating at a pharmacologically induced delta frequency. Now, what you'll notice is that we have actually 10 by 10 electrodes in the tissue, but the resolution of the, the movie is 30 by 30. So we're going from 100 pixels to 900 pixels. And this allows us to do something we couldn't do before because we are actually able to make out the layered structure of the neocortex that we know is there from anatomical studies, but we couldn't actually see before when we were doing this sort of, um, this sort of work. If we look at an average of all these delta periods, we can recognize that on different parts of the delta period, the tissue is doing different things. And from that, we can learn a lot about what is actually going on in the underlying neural network. 
So I think with this we can outline a design specification for uh, ultrasound holography with super resolution, wire compressed sensing, and real-time cloud services. So in terms of mobility, we're aiming for something handheld, but with an eye to, to the future, something that is wearable, but certainly more practical than this example here. In terms of computability, well, we rely on the continued development of cloud services and mobile uh, signal processing devices. And finally, and most importantly, in terms of the quality, we're looking for something which will allow the user to recognize, navigate, and uh, respond in an informed way in an environment which is uh, visually impairing. So with that, we have reached the end and, and a joke. Thank you very much. Understanding uh, the, the amount of computing processing you yes. might need for, for this. Yes. I mean, as, as Roman also said, it depends on a lot of things what we want to do. I can tell you what it required for what we're already doing. So um, we, we were sort of running uh, a minute's worth of data uh, sampled at 30 kilohertz, which uh, we need to have. 30, 40 gigabytes of RAM to do. And it's, it's mainly a thing uh, of RAM. The processing, we, we can wait for. Um, if we want it to be real time, it's a different matter. But it doesn't, doesn't actually take a long time because it's based on FFT. So uh, I think that is within the sort of uh, possibilities that you know, it, it's very easy to accelerate the FFT. Thank you very much again. Thank you.